We are very, very pleased uh, to have Pavan Sukhdev uh, join us here, not just at the NatCap Symposium today, but also to join WWF. I'm uh, Rebecca Sharm, the Chief Scientist at WWF. Um, we uh, were are really fortunate to have uh, welcomed Pavan into WWF as the Chair of the International Board starting January 1st this year. Already the conversations that he's inspiring within WWF are shaking things up in the most magical way possible. And so I'm so grateful that he joined. As you, many of you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Sukhdev has uh, had a long and pioneering career. Uh, first in international finance, which doesn't always get a great, have a great reputation, but when it, when it actually bursts people like Pavan, you know that the potential is there. He, it began at Deutsche Bank, uh, and then went on, to, he went on to lead uh, the thinking on a green economy at the UN and has worked tirelessly since then on the future of corporate engagement and building that green economy and a more sustainable world. He was a leader at, at uh, one of the one of, uh, UN's, uh, I think, really very influential reports uh, towards a green economy. Um, it was a landmark project of the Economic and Ecosystems and Biodiversity called TEEB, more, more uh, commonly known as TEEB. Uh, and it really has changed the, that report along with the work that was done and the spin-off work from that has really changed the way we think about how we need to think about how we br bring environmental and um, aspects into the way, we, the way we run our economy. Uh, his, his work has won him international acclaim, including the prestigious Gothenburg Award for Sustainable Development and the Blue Planet Prize. And he continues to be uh, acclaimed for his work, and he is a uh, UNEP Goodwill Ambassador uh, for that. So I could go on and on and on, but most importantly, what you should know about Pavan is uh, why WWF. And I found out in my conversations with Pavan and this is like the cool and interesting creative thinking that we need, for sure. Uh, it was tigers and not finance that brought him to, <laughs> to a green economy. Think about it, the impact the tigers have on the economy is huge. So, of course, it naturally led this way. But early in his career, uh, Pavan thought through, uh, as people were saying, well, the, w the way we could actually save the tiger populations on the planet is just breed them and sell them and their parts and in doing so, you would take the pressure off the wild population. And Pavan, through his thinking and modeling, showed that that is not true. That what you actually do when you actually create, you actually create the market, and then the market then moves to actually want the more elite or the more uh, prestigious uh, uh, element in that market. And so uh, that if you actually bred tigers for sale, you would uh, lead to the extinction of the tiger population globally much faster than if you didn't. And that was, that was counterintuitive and, and everybody in WWF said, what? But now it's th sort of the way we think about uh, the world in WWF. But it's that kind of thinking early on in his career that has permeated his entire career. And one of the reasons why we're so grateful to have him at WWF as the international board chair, but even more grateful that he traveled all the way from Florida, getting at 5 a.m. this morning uh, to talk to us today for three hours about the signpost to the future. <laughs> really, he could talk for three hours. So well, welcome, Pavan. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Yes, it was indeed at 5 a.m. that I finally landed up here on a very much delayed flight. Is, uh, is anyone in the audience from room 1067 at the hotel by any chance? <laughs> room 1067. To that person, I render an unconditional apology because I was given his key. I then wandered straight into 1067 to hear a very irate gentleman saying, who's this? Who's there? So I didn't tell him who it was, but I now apologize. It was not my mistake. I was given that key. Okay, so. <laughs> but anyway, I'm very, very, very pleased to be with, with all of you and uh, I'm delighted to be with friends from uh, the world of ecosystems, the world of valuation, the world of natural capital project, natural capital coalition, and of course, most recently, the world of WWF. Um, it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey for me. So today I want to not spend, uh, Rebecca, three hours, even though I did ask for three hours. I'm going to try and finish in one hour. But three topics. Uh, three topics which I believe are um, 
probably captivating a number of people, certainly have captivated me. Uh, and these are questions that I ask myself uh, looking back and then looking ahead. So I would like to share these with you and, and call them three signposts to the future. Uh, this image that you see here is inspiring. This is from uh, a corporate partner of, of ours <clears throat> called Sviasko, which is Sweden's largest forestry company. Uh, I thank them for the image because to me it, it not only demonstrates an ecosystem service, but it also demonstrates the reason why we are here, which is for the next generation. A bit about WWF, so this is the, the commercial break, if you like. So, uh, but it is an amazing organization. I joined it with many, for many good reasons. And uh, today we are supported by 5.4 million members. The 767 million euros is the amount of money that we collect and invest in environmental and natural projects every year. 6,890 is the number of people we have. These are permanent full-time employees. And they are stretched across 85 different offices, which cover 100 and more countries around the world. Uh, so th these are some of the, the sort of startling statistics which impressed me about WWF and are among the reasons why I joined. Um, <clears throat> before the, the Global Goals, before the SDGs were brought out, the management and the boards of WWF, and, and there are, by the way, 34 different boards of national organizations of WWF, just to give you a sense of how extensive is the, is the uh, governance network there. Uh, the management and the boards that come together to uh, agree on shared ambitions and to agree on seven major goals that they'd set themselves, which in fact, when we look back, they're not, quite, they're not that far from some of the, the key targets that have been set within the SDGs in terms of protecting and restoring land and sea areas, eliminating illegal wildlife trade, doubling sustainable fisheries, halting deforestation, keeping the important rivers flowing, halving the impacts of the food system, and that's big because if you just look at the value chain climate impacts, I've seen estimates from 24% to 45% of how much of the climate impacts are food system related holistically, um, and halving greenhouse gas emissions altogether. And, uh, <coughs> These goals, uh, these shared ambitions of the WWF network, uh, relate to a whole host of areas of expertise. And I'm delighted that I came in at a very exciting time where this huge organization had recognized that even though it had mission congruence around these various goals and around something called the Global Compact, which was signed in 2012, it didn't really have strategy congruence because there were 34 independent boards running 34 independent mission-driven organizations. So the, the, the joint decision to create a practice group structure was actually quite gutsy, and I must say that impressed me. Having come from, among other things, the world of investment banking, and having been in charge as a manage, managing director at Deutsche Bank through two very painful transitions of reorganization, I know how difficult that is. So hats off to Marco and his board colleagues and all of the other boards for having achieved this. And uh, I think this is, an alignment along knowledge. So it's not, a, it's not an ownership, it's not about changing whose boss is who, but it's really more about creating rills of uh, collaboration or channels of energy which can be extended beyond the boundaries of WWF. So we have actual practice groups who look at uh, species and oceans and forests and fresh water and food and climate, and of course markets, finance and governance, these are the, the other three. So there are nine practice groups and no doubt and no doubt uh, you people will come across them in your, in your interactions. Uh, coming to the Natural Capital Project, this, this slide is probably an old version of, of the Natural Capital Project's uh, areas of shared outcomes, but I was pleased to learn that very early on, WWF had collaborated with you uh, on sustainable development planning and on uh, sustainable livable cities, uh, sorry, on, on, uh, on standards for the private sector, but now of course, with this new practice sector, uh, new practice groups structure that we have, I think that opens up many more areas of collaboration. And here's some of the other things that WWF has been involved, broadly speaking, in the space of natural capital, uh, recognizing its value, uh, um, demonstrating its value, and capturing its value. Uh, countries uh, all the way from uh, Belize and uh, Indonesia to uh, uh, Burma, uh, Myanmar, and Mozambique. Uh, a lot of work with uh, Mark, your groups on, on the uh, natural capital protocol and the sector guides that have come out. Uh, piloting uh, the natural capital protocol with a few important companies. 
working on numerous payments for ecosystem services around the world. A lot of effort right from the last 60 years of WWF's history. Uh, the, the organization was founded in 1960. Um, so a lot of effort on creating protected areas, if you like the, what was now referred to as the old style of conservation, but actually very valuable if you think what it has uh, prevented and what it has achieved, and of course many others. So uh, today I want to uh, pick on uh, the three areas which I think are all carefully selected because A, I'm passionate about them, B, I think you in the Natural Capital Project and its many partners around the world uh, and also WWF do have interest in these. And these are around three questions. One is to do with the, the change in thinking as well as the change in terminology and, and uh, some of the, the background to this transition between ecosystem services and what we now refer to as nature's contributions <coughs> to people. Apologies to Mark for NCP, which is actually the wrong acronym because that could be confused with the Natural Capital Protocol. So I do have to be careful about using acronyms now. Uh, my second area is, is the Natural Capital Protocol itself and uh, therefore uh, the work for the Natural Capital Coalition, which as, as you will see my comments in, in a moment, is uh, probably quite interesting and quite challenging, uh, but also gives us a huge range of opportunities. And the third area is, is that, as, as you're aware, uh, there are uh, institutional arrangements that are being set up uh, around the world which reflect either uh, the, the work of economists, such as in the United Nations Environment Program and the UN University, which leads towards the Inclusive Wealth Framework, which has four capitals, or others which such as, uh, such as the uh, IR framework, the integrated reporting framework, uh, result in the use of six capitals, and I've even heard of a seventh one called inspirational capital. So the challenge that I see there is, is one of not just confusing lexicon, but also confusing decision makers. And you can confuse lexicons, at the end of the day that's no big deal, but you don't want to confuse good action. And you don't want to create a disconnect between the micro level and the macro level when it comes to economic framing of these propositions. So I am a bit concerned and I've been wondering a lot as to how to address this and then I would like to reflect uh, some thoughts on that somewhat vexing matter. So to begin with, uh, the whole challenge of ecosystem services. What, what was wrong with ecosystem services? Is there anything wrong with ecosystem services? And I'm sure if there's... Um, uh, what, 200 people here, then there would be uh, different opinions, not necessarily 200, but definitely a, a plurality of opinions on that topic. Uh, the way I see it, I think the language that IPBES has evolved, nature's contribution to people, is a lot less um, exclusive than perhaps the language of ecosystem services, and here's the reasons why I think so. So. Uh, the term ecosystem services and the implications that it generates in, in certain minds has, is one of the reasons why the ALBA countries, Bolivia, Colombia, and the others, have been very uh, antipathetic towards the idea of even mentioning the word valuation in the context of nature. To them, it's almost sacrilege that, you know, how can we think of Pachamama, that is Mother Nature, as something that would have an, any economic connotation. That's that is heresy, uh, she is sacred, there is no way you can even think of uh, Pachamama in, in economic terms, so there's that. Um, that's to some extent a reaction to the somewhat Judeo-Christian attitude that sometimes comes through in, in terms of man's dominance over nature as against the sort of more traditional attitudes of man being part of nature. Another dimension is this presumption of what we call, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, Cartesianism, which is to try and be logical and, and uh, very clinical in some ways in using the term natural capital because as we in the world of Teeb had defined, natural capital is an economic metaphor for the limited stocks of physical and biological resources found on earth and of the limited capacity of ecosystems to provide ecosystem services. But having said that, the moment you say natural capital, you need to also accept that it is defined as the net present value of future ecosystem services. So there is an implication that you're going from the term uh, ecosystem services to natural capital because one sums up after discounting to the other. So there are these, these connotations which are real. And then um, 
a few years back, uh, four or five years ago, uh, a number of German and French NGOs were very uh, uh, antagonized by the idea that somehow or the other we, uh, we economists who were thinking in terms of valuation, actually quite differently from pricing, but the presumption was that this is all one thing. I mean, surely the moment you say valuation, you mean pricing. What else can you possibly mean? And if you mean pricing, that means you must be financializing this because that's, finan that's the financial price, that's the financial quantity, which means you must be commodifying it, which means you must be selling it. Therefore, you must be privatizing the commons. So, of course, these are not uh, natural assumptions, but you can see how the thinking can go in that direction, and that's unfortunately what happened. So there was a degree of alienation amongst the NGO community in, in Europe, uh, especially the German and the French NGOs, some of them. Now, all of these are, are answerable objections, and indeed they have been answered. In, fi in fact, there is a document, a TEEB document, which says uh, TEEB challenges and responses. I was one of the authors of that. But having written that or co-authored that, I realized that this is not about logic. This is about the heart. This is about understanding people and being inclusive, and therefore I, I do wish that we had been a bit more inclusive. In particular, going back 10 years, even though we had got very good phrases in English which were punchlines which explained the difference between valuation and pricing and which explained the importance of valuation as a human institution, which is how we described it in our reports, the fact is nobody reads a 600-page report that is Teep Foundations. Nobody, very few people read a 450-page report that's Teep for Policymaker. Some may read Teep for Local Policy. Uh, because it's only 250 pages, and, and the business community, some of them might claim to read Teep for Business, which is 350 pages. But the fact is, that's not what people read. People look at the headlines, they look at the messages, key messages. And you know the simple mistake that we made from our side in Teep? We did not translate those key messages into Spanish. Simple, fundamental error. And I apologize for that error, it was 10 years too late, but anyway, that, that was my fault. I didn't think about it. I was too busy reading and writing and expressing myself in English, as one tends to do. So uh, I will not do it again. Next time I'll, we have something like this, we will find the right language to describe what we are trying to say in a way that does not force people to read, uh, how much is it, 1,400 pages a month, something like that, altogether. For, yeah. So uh, as one can always be wise in hindsight, of course, but that's, that, is, that is the situation. Now. Uh, those of you who want to read the challenges and responses document recommended. It's only about 20 pages, but uh, its response here, which is the logical response, but not the heart response, is that, well, actually all human relationships with nature are valid, but in relative contexts. Institutions, the, so now I'm going back to the, to the way that T brought in institutions. We had the work of Douglas North, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and Vatten later. And these are the definitions that we used in defining institutions. And we described valuation as a human institution in the sense that uh, it's one of the rules of the road or it's a kind of constructed set of typifications and rules. And we did say that there are different ways of approaching uh, valuation and that approaches like Cartesianism would lead in one direction, a democratic approach which has deliberation and social process methods would lead to another approach, and the complexity approach would lead to yet another approach. And so this was there, but I think the error was not making this plain in different languages to the people who mattered. Um, and specifically on the point of, of the Judeo-Christian uh, culture and beliefs, I think that's something that keeps coming up even now, because I think the, the recognition uh, in literature is there, that there are different ways of looking at man and nature. Um, there are also different worldviews and perceptions in terms of are we homo economicus, i.e. egotistical utility maximizers in the classical neoclassical tradition, or are we people who behave altruistically? And Gaudi, who was one of our authors, um, has actually pulled together some evidence of non-retaliatory behavior, uh, non-cooperative behavior eliciting uh, cooperative responses. So there are, there are uh, many different um, perspectives. But perhaps the single thing that, which I mentioned in terms of the headline, the not having the right headline, is that we failed to understand that uh, valor and price, which, which th these are different words for valuation and pricing, actually sound different, whether you say it in, in English or Spanish or Portuguese. 
Um, and we didn't have the Spanish and Portuguese versions of these very simple Teep statements, which was what people in the English language world read and understood and probably didn't particularly, you know, they shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, it makes sense. But in the non-English language world, this wasn't obvious. Uh, particularly what, what we did emphasize quite early on is that markets, which is st just stating the facts, provide prices for private goods and services, not public goods. But you can use market-based valuation approaches to estimate values and then press them into policy, press them into business practice. This is a little cartoon that I love. You know, this is the sort of caricature of what is valuation about. This is not what valuation is about. What, the way that the, the world of Teeb approached valuation is not that you know, everything can be measured in money, therefore you can buy and sell it, but rather that it's a human institution and that you can recognize value. Um, recognizing value has is, is been visible there for a long time. I mean, the oldest national parks, I mentioned national parks, have been based on recognizing value, on, on recognizing patrimony. Uh, the national parks in the US here in, in the UK, largely were the oldest one, were made on that logic that this is something to be preserved for future generations. You can demonstrate value, and there are many examples. The TEAB, the TEAB reports have something like 40, 45, 50 different examples of demonstration of value. And finally, you can capture value. And these uh, forms of valuation can elicit different policy responses. They can translate into regional plans, uh, Baokshin County, in fact, using the, the invest software of the Natural Capital Project. Uh, there can be legislations like in, in Tobahata Reef in the Philippines, uh, where a coral reef area was protected to ensure uh, sustainable fishing. There can be certifications, there can be valuations of protected areas, which is examples of demonstrating value. And finally, you can capture value through pay payments of ecosystem services, recognizing, of course, that a majority of PES are actually between governments either governments on both sides or governments on one side. So it's not your typical market in that sense. The PES only uses market logic to understand what is a fair value to be put into a payment for ecosystem service agreement. And if you look at the same five responses, you could cluster the top two as being responses in the nature of norms and regulations and policies, then next three in the nature of economic mechanisms. And then finally, there are some markets examples, but I haven't even covered them. So. If you look at all of the literature of the T project, about 120 odd examples, about 50 of them are in the nature of plans and legislations. Uh, another uh, 50, 60 are certifications, PA valuations, and payments for ecosystem services. And there are 11, exactly 11 markets examples, including wetland markets here in the US and, and biodiversity markets in Australia and so on. So that's actually the world of TEEB and TEEB's perspective on valuation. Well, I think what, what uh, in, in closing, what I'll say is that I think the, the idea of choosing a, a terminology which is more inclusive, more respectful of different perspectives is a good idea. But at the same time, we should not also forget that there is some use of the ecosystem service perspective as well. After all, we have, as a result of that, the Team for Business Coalition, which became the Natural Capital Coalition, which has produced the Natural Capital Protocol, <laughs> which has upwards of 270 followers. And I think the, the achievement of that is fantastic. I mean, if I, if I go back 10 years to 2008, um, if someone had asked me, so what do you think out of these four TEEB reports, TEEB for policymakers, uh, TEEB for local administrators and policy, TEEB for business, and TEEB for people, this is the website, which of these do you think will have the most impact and fastest? I would have immediately said, oh, well, definitely the local policymakers, and then after that, maybe the national ones. And I would have put business third. But congratulations, Mark, to you and your team and your collaborators that I would now put you first in terms of where has been the maximum change of mindset and the maximum willingness to engage, I think, is actually on the business side. So I, I have been surprised myself by the, the results of this, this entire history and pleasantly surprised, I should say. Thank you. The, the second area that I'd, I'd like to discuss is, is the natural capital protocol and what happens next. So first, um, a quick bit of promotion, if I may, for what I think is an excellent project. Um, the coalition, uh, the Natural Capital Coalition, uh, is a large network which consists of about 150 businesses, about 50-odd NGOs, and a whole host of uh, policymakers and, and conservation organizations and other membership organizations and research houses and finance 
houses and so on. So altogether there are about 270 thereabouts, right? And in the, so it's, it's a huge network and a powerful network in terms of creating uh, the, the awareness that is required for natural capital to be appropriately absorbed and reflected in policies, in decision making there, in the business side and decision making there. Uh, its vision is a world that conserves and enhances natural capital. So that can't be very far from anyone's heart who's in this audience today. And its purpose is to mainstream the inclusion of natural capital in decision making, harmonizing the approaches and getting them to scale quickly. And I like the quickly word there, the word there, because as you know, that is, that is my favorite. We don't have time. Only because of that, because we don't have time. So these are some of the, the uh, companies who uh, embraced the, the protocol and uh, more than 50 have contributed to piloting the program. And there's a whole host of other companies who've piloted components of the entire recommendation of the natural capital protocol. As you can see, the, the list is pretty much a who's who. I mean, there's a large number of very well-known names in that list. And uh, the process has been admirable. So there was a group led and hosted by the World Business Council which uh, wrote the actual protocol, which is the, the mother document, so to speak. Then there, there were two sector guides written almost simultaneously by a group hosted by the IUCN. And then now there's, as the, the, the uh, outreach was, was uh, very heartwarming. So I understand that more than 40,000 copies of the National Capital Coalition and its various documents have been made through your website or through other uh, websites of other organizations. And the family of documents has grown. So the dark ones are ones which are ready. The others are either uh, ready to publish or not yet ready. Um, and uh, they consist of more sector guides, including uh, on forest products and, and on the built environment that's coming up. And they also include supplementary information in various sectors uh, in terms of finance and, uh, and uh, areas of nature, such as oceans and biodiversity. So all in all, a very good uh, uh, effort from the community that represents the world of business and those who are interested in business, as in policymakers, administrators, uh, research houses, finance, and so on. Now, the questions that strike me as, as questions that are still open are the following six. Question one is about standardization. And how will we, we have the protocol, uh, we clearly have guidance. So the question is, how do we make that guidance translate to standards, which then can be followed and then can be audited and, and assured by appropriate assurance bodies. Second is how do we operationalize? Because at the end of the day, um, the whole discovery process of impacts and dependencies on nature is a discovery process. And its output, its first output is just a document which says what are the company's impacts and dependencies on nature. But the, but the real point is, how do we minimize the negative impacts? How do we minimize the risks which come from the dependencies? What systems do we change? What products do we change? What client groups do we change? What sourcing do we change? What value chains do we manage? What, what value chains do we alter? So it's the operationalizing that, that really is, is key. And the question is, how do we go from uh, measuring to managing? Then the third question is to do with transparency. That if you have all this information, uh, and if you're a responsible company, why would you not be disclosing it? If you're responsible, then you ought to disclose your impacts on the public. And that is, that is a vexing question. And the fourth is about comprehensiveness, because as you'll see in a moment, um, even though you may begin with questioning environmental impacts and natural capital impacts, you will see very quickly that those are not limited by some magical boundary to natural capital. In fact, they spill over, and that is the whole point, into the human space, and vice versa happens as well. Uh, the fifth question is, is uh, particularly from my friends in WWF, which is, how much is too much? I mean, if we have a problem with impacts, we need to limit them. If there is, for instance, a world of cement and a world of, of energy, which, is both, uh, which are both using water, how much is an appropriate amount of water to, to allocate to the world of energy, especially fossil fuel energy, nuclear energy, and how much to allocate to the world of cement? and so on, given that there is a, limit, a limitation on the amount that can be used. And finally, and perhaps to me where I want to begin with attempting to give my, my take on these questions, and finally, what do investors want? What do regulators want? What does civil society want? What does the corporate management itself want, the C-suite? 
These are the stakeholders in the corporation. Our whole purpose here in creating the, the Natural Capital Coalition and the documents uh, from the protocol and its, attendant, and its associated documents is to be able to inform and assist the corporate world into moving forward. But what do its stakeholders think? What do they want next? So let me go there first and just try and address firstly the investor world because um, some may argue with me, but I would say that it is really important to focus on the investors. At the end of the day, it is their decisions that determine the decisions of corporate management or at least the longevity of corporate management, whoever is there. So uh, a, a couple of surveys were done by Eurosif and by ACCA some time ago. And these were their surprising results, which is that 96% of the surveyed investors felt that the sustainability information that was being put out by companies um, was not quantitative enough. It was just not quantitative enough, and they wanted quantitative KPIs. 92% said that the non-financial information that represented sustainability was just not integrated enough into the main reports of the companies. They didn't want a separate little glossy brochure that comes out at Christmas so nobody reads it. They actually wanted it in the same place as the financial statements, which come out whenever they do at the, at the end of the, close to the end of the financial year. 84% said that they agreed or strongly agreed that standardization was critical and they didn't see standardization yet. And eight, another 84% said that they didn't agree that companies were clear as to how they, had how they had decided what issues and what impacts are material versus non-material. So these are, so I, I dispute anyone who says that investors aren't interested in all this. They clearly are interested. They're not satisfied. They're not satisfied with today's state of affairs. And that tells us where we need to go. Uh, specifically, if we look at how much of the of the investment universe is actually already examining sustainability. And I got a first-hand indication of that. Uh, I was at the uh, annual management conference of the Standard & Poor's of SNP just yesterday. They had a whole session on ESG. Everyone was riveted and listening. We had a panel of eight people. And um, it was clear that they were interested. There was no question of that. And they were aware of the information that I'm sharing with you right now which is that if we look at the total assets that have been filtered through by investment portfolios through the lens of sustainability, that amount has, gone, has increased from 13 trillion in 2012 to 23 trillion in 2016 over two reporting periods of two years each. That is a massive increase in what is actually not a small asset class. At 23 trillion, we are now talking about one-tenth of the entire invested debt and equity on, in the world. So this is not boutique anymore. The world of sustainability is now getting into mainstream. And how do companies, oh, sorry, how do investors determine what is sustainable or not? Like when I said filter through the lens of sustainability, well, the lens of sustainability is like the eye of the fly. It has many facets. And there are many different ways of looking at sustainability. But some of the most popular are the ones that I highlight in red out here which is, as you can see, negative screening or exclusionary screening is the one that is the most popular. Uh, and those which are negatively screened, the assets are, have gone up from 8 trillion to 15 trillion. But to me, what is really exciting is the fact that the most rapidly growing lens is the one of ESG integration, which means looking at things holistically and together, looking at the corporate performance, not as something distinct and to be given to only shareholders, whilst you allow the ESG and the sustainability report to be given to us NGOs, whoever we may be in my case, WWF, but to be given together. And that integration is being sought from a corporate strategy perspective as well. So that integration lens has grown the fastest from 5.9 trillion to 10.4 trillion in the same period. And of course, there are other lenses, as you can see, norms based screening and corporate engagement and so on and so on. So that, I think, in, in essence, what I'd say on the investor side is that, yes, they are interested. They are actually acutely interested, and they are dissatisfied, and they're looking for more. Now, what about the C-suite? Because at the end of the day, the corporation's long-term direction may be decided by which CEOs get voted in or out by boards, but it's the CEO and his, and his immediate management who decide what the company does. So to me, there are four reasons for um, a, a sensible company to believe that they should be focused on sustainability even if their sole purpose is to improve the results of the company. 
The one is that if they are smart about sustainability in terms of resource efficiency, energy efficiency, and nowadays even energy pricing because solar seems to be getting cheaper than, than coal-fired, uh, then they should be looking at cost reduction benefits. Number two, that they should be looking at risk reduction benefits as well, and in more than one way because externalities of the corporation, today's externalities are basically tomorrow's risks, tomorrow's risks, uh, risks are day after tomorrow's costs. So by reducing risk, they are eventually going to reduce their costs as well. By reducing externalities, they're going to reduce their risks. So they need to look at that. Then on the positive side, they need to look at what innovation value can be provided by exploring the technology behind sustainability. What new segments, what new markets, what new niches they can explore. Um, can they target a different product, for instance, to, to the uh, somewhat more heavily oriented millennials who are understanding, more understanding of sustainability issues? And last but not the least, brand value, which has ma massive benefits for the, the, the uh, uh, business of the company and also has benefits in terms of the quality of people that you can hire to run, to run your company in future. So there is an interest from the C-suite, and that's the reason. I, these are the logical reasons. Of course, some people doubt this. They, they tell me, and I have uh, some sympathy for that logic, which is that, look, if, it, if the manager is a good manager, he is good at being profitable and he's good at being sustainable or she is good at being sustainable and profitable. So there is a degree of correlation as well here. It's not just about causality. So I, I'd like to leave that thought with you as well. What about regulators? Well, again, there are strong reasons for them to be asking the Natural Capital Coalition to look ahead. And here's what I think I hear from regulators. One, generally, that a single report is better than lots of different reports. Secondly, that we need to, we the, that is the regulators and the policymakers, need to understand when they are hearing uh, information on value creation and social value creation, how much, what's the quantity, and how valid is it, is it verified, can it be audited. Then they are trying to understand businesses' negative impacts because there is so much uh, pushback on various different negative impacts in order to introduce new regulations. So how much are the negative impacts? So they are looking to quantify there as well. So there is the strong interest. And lastly, there are many countries, including, as you can see, the EU, Singapore, India, and so on, who have already introduced national regulations. And I've just listed on the web links. By the way, these slides will be available to the audience here. So don't worry too much if your photographs don't look pretty. You'll, you'll get the original. <laughs> you'll get the originals. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, Another, another question, and uh, even though it's last, but it's not the least, which is what does civil society want? Well, I, I would say two things. I think it's looking to value itself. Like, if I'm an NGO like WWF, what is our impact on nature? Like, what's the natural capital that we've managed to save or help create or participate in as part of a constellation of actors? What have we actually done in terms of natural capital? Can we measure us? Right? That's a question. And secondly, can we measure others? As in, can we ask others to put down appropriately, what is the total negative impact they have? And let's then bilaterally discuss ways of reducing that. So I think this is a question that many NGOs are, are, certainly, uh, are certainly asking already. So these are some of the, the uh, um, reasons why I think stakeholders are looking for more. And I'm not, I don't blame them. So if you look at today's corporate reporting as an example, here's what it looks like. You have financial reporting and non-financial reporting, and that goes to different people. Then within the broadly non-financial space, you have got sustainability reporting, which has a different meaning, and that goes to yet other people who are focused on that. And then a kind of stakeholder reporting, which of course includes shareholders, so therefore it cuts across both financial and non-financial. And then finally, you have the classical CSR reports, which are a subset of the subset. And all of these have some users somewhere or the other. So the, 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 uh, the uh, effort that a responsible company today has to put in is, is is nightmarish, and I call today's corporate reporting a nightmare, and I call tomorrow's corporate reporting a dream. But unfortunately, for two reasons, because it's still a dream. So, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm hoping that you know, with your help, with the coalition and and with other parallel organisations and their collaboration, that we can get there because it, we are not that far away. It's about making this this jungle coincide, and I think you, uh, Mark, refer to this as the lake into which information dips and from which you can source information, so if you can think of this as the, as the, the circular lake, which is <laughs> providing all of the inputs that, uh, that users of information need. 
Uh, it will need clarity, however, on which capitals you classify with. It will need consistency across different industries and across companies in the industry. And it will need connectivity with the SDGs. Well, without that, this information is not sufficiently uh, categorized. Uh, so it will need that, but I do believe this is possible. And I want to show you a few glimpses of the future. So let's try and address the six questions that, that I asked us as, as uh, if you like, the to-dos of the future. So here's on the standardization point. So typical situation is that you have black boxes, and whether it's GIST or TrueCost or whoever it is who's doing it, everyone's, or, or Price Waterhouse or Ernst & Young or whoever, everyone's got their own little black box and is busy doing that. But thankfully, uh, India has taken some leadership in this, and the Confederation of Indian Industry, with the help of GIST, which I have something to do with as well, in full disclosure, has uh, chosen one framework and one set of methodologies which are being made public first to the companies and with their agreement to the rest of the world. So there's one framework for the country to be able to measure its, for any company to be able to measure its natural capital impacts and one set of, and the same one set of methodologies. In terms of comprehensiveness, is this only about natural capital? Well, for several years now, since 2013, companies have been experimenting with a form of integrated reporting that's called integrated profit and loss. It's not the whole of integrated reporting because you also need to have forward-looking strategy statements and you also need to have risk control reviews. In other words, looking at risk areas, seeing what controls there are and seeing whether the company manages to meet, uh, to, to achieve those controls, quantifying those controls and, and categorizing them. So but at the same time, understanding impacts beyond the shareholder, looking at stakeholders, understanding in, the, in, the, in terms of natural, human, social, and physical capital. I think that's important, and these logos that you see are some of the pioneers in that space over the last few years. And I think there's, apart from the fact that people are experimenting and doing this, I actually think there's a fundamental reason why we have to go beyond one capital. It can't only be the natural capital coalition, Mark. So, uh, <laughs> it's, and here's why. Because if you look at the, the chain of impacts, you begin with drivers, which are environmental drivers. It could be greenhouse gas emissions, fresh water, you know, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And they will generate certain outcomes, which could be environmental outcomes. But the impacts in terms of changes in human well-being will not be only be on natural capital. If you have, if you have uh, greenhouse gas emissions causing impacts such as storms and cyclones and floods, but also disease vectors increasing, then there are impacts, of course, on the economy. So, and there are impacts on, on natural capital, but there are also impacts on human health. So that, that is fundamentally a human capital impact. Likewise, if you have employment drivers, as in training and investment by the company and its employees, it will generate employee skills and productivity, which generates human capital impacts. And if you have CSR in the company, then, or if you have programs where youth are being trained, for instance, in doing jobs, which the company has the capacity to train, then you will increase incomes for, for the youth, reduce unemployment in the youth, you will reduce social unrest, you may improve law and order, and these are elements of social capital. So you will get into human and social capital. And then if you add value in terms of, let's say, taxes collected, which I used, uh, let's say, for infrastructure and road transportation, then you will potentially increase productivity of people who are using that transportation system, increase incomes, reduce unemployment, save costs on transportation, and that could have impacts on physical and human as well as natural capital. So where you begin and where you end is usually very often a different box in terms of the capital category. And I think we need to recognize that interlinkage that, that we have in, in evaluating these spaces. The size of human capital impacts is, is something that I just want to emphasize and the importance of the corporation because not many realize the role of the company in, in its in, as a trainer of people. A lot of training is imparted. This is uh, uh, perhaps an iconic example of Infosys, the Indian IT major. Um, it's a, it was at this time the exercise was done, uh, a $6 billion corporation, hiring 30,000 young Indians every year, training them in this somewhat space age looking uh, training complex in a small city called Mangalore in, in India. And um, quite an impressive 300, 20-acre campus, which trains uh, for six months 15,000 people each, and with 15,000 students and 5,000 staff and teachers, 
That's 20,000 people, and that's bigger than Yale University, where I used to teach for a while. So that's one company, one company, and it's training apparatus. So you can imagine the human capital that it's creating, because as employees join this company and as they gather the skills, the knowledge, the expertise, it needs to be not just uh, intelligent engineers, but now IT engineers, they increase their earnings profile from here to something like here. And you can work out against benchmarks and distribute benchmark how much change that has done in terms of their expectations when they joined and their expectations two to three or four years later when they left. And that change is the increase in human capital that has been driven by the training program and the brand value and the training experience in the first few years delivered by the company to its employees. When they leave, they carry all that knowledge and expertise with them. They are exporting. Therefore, the company is de facto exporting human capital. That's a positive externality. It is huge. For this $6 billion company, that positive externality was in the range of $1 to $1.2 billion per annum. So that's the, the, the human capital value that it's generating and imparting to the outside world every year, sending people off or being hired from them to join IBM out here or, or, <laughs> or joining companies in the UK and Australia, or, any, or for that matter, any English language speaking part of the world. Uh, Infosys actually published these externality numbers and they actually pr kept producing them to create a data series for the next several years. They did that themselves. We just audited, audited this for them. Axon Nobel produced an IP, they're a chemicals giant in, in Europe, produced an integrated profit and loss in 2014. Here's what it looked like, and they actually analyzed this for their Brazilian business operations, six factories, or the whole of the Brazilian business operation, which was a part of their pulp, a very important part of their pulp and performance chemicals division, in fact, the second largest after Sweden. Amata is an amazing and sustainable forestry company in Brazil, logging at two trees per hectare per year across five different locations, and they produced an integrated profit and loss in 2015. Yarra Valley Water, that is Melbourne's water utility. For them, this was not, a, not an option. They had to go this way, as they felt, because their purpose, the, the state of Victoria defined their purpose as achieving livability in Melbourne. And Melbourne's been voted the most livable city by none other than the Economist Intelligence Unit now for six years running, so clearly there is some uh, value being delivered here. Um, the, the Yarra Valley water, water utility essentially are now uh, internalizing these results and they have decided that uh, they want to double the amount of social value. They had created some social value as a result of their programs and they wish to target double that amount of social value creation by 2020. So we've been asked to help them in identifying projects and programs which would help them to do that. So actually looking to increase their positive externalities. So this is a lot of commitment being shown by a lot of leaders. So I suspect the challenge here is going to be how do we take this forward? How do we take this forward? And remember, this is all being done on a holistic basis. This is not purely a natural capital focus. This is looking at human, social, and natural capital altogether, as well as, of course, physical capital. Another question uh, that I'd asked was how much is too much? Well, there's some, this is very, very challenging because how do you, uh, on what ethics and on what logical grounds do you allocate a scarce resource between different industries and who are you to do that allocation? But at the same time, to not ask the question is a challenge because then we are not being real. So I think the question does need to be asked. I think people need to state their assumptions and explore this space as indeed WWF and its partners are doing these days. I haven't addressed two of the questions, but uh, on the one on operationalization, I understand that already is it 30% of the companies that are in the natural capital uh, coalition have in fact already started using the results. So that's a good sign. And I guess your challenge then becomes, how do, you, do we take that from a 30% to a 90, 80, 90%? And when it comes to transparency, I mean, to be honest, I think this is just an ethical choice. And I, I would like to ask the question to anyone who says that they don't wish to disclose. I will just ask one very simple question. If you are a responsible corporation, tell me the reason why you would not want to disclose your impacts to the public. And that's all I have to say on this point, because it is about ethics. Now I, I move to my last uh, topic of conversation. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry for not giving you something more intellectual on that particular one, but it's much more simple. <laughs> so on last, my last topic is on this issue of coherence between different capital frameworks, because a lot of people in different uh, ways and, and in different communities are using the language of capitals, and I am just beginning to get a bit concerned. But let me begin with the good news, is that uh, um, 
uh, Professor Partha Das Gupta, who I, I respect as one of my gurus, um, is outstanding for many reasons, but his ability to express complex ideas in simple language and to do it so beautifully is seen by this little extract I have from his foreword to the Inclusive Wealth Report of 2014 that was produced by the United Nations Environment and by UN University, and in which he says, he talks about the four capital, capital categories and says that inclusive wealth is the social value of an economy's capital assets, which comprise manufactured capital, roads, buildings, machines, equipment, etc. Human capital, that's skills, education, health. Natural capital, that's subsoil resources, ecosystems, the atmosphere. And then he goes on to explain social capital thus. He says, such are the durable assets as knowledge institutions, culture, religion, more broadly, social capital are taken to be enabling assets, that is, assets that enable the production and allocation of assets in the other three categories. And the effectiveness of enabling assets in a country gets reflected in the shadow prices of assets in the other three categories. In other words, if you have an economy which is lacking in social capital, not enough regulation, no, in, no law and order, lack of a proper constitution, poor relationships, poor mores in society, uh, communal disharmony, misbehavior, and so on. So if you have that kind of society, then chances are that it will not have an effectively run economy. The law of contract will not be followed, contracts will not be honored, business will become difficult. Um, violations of all forms of social agreement will be the consequence. And we will have poor outcomes. In other words, the assets of Natural capital will get pillaged, so they don't get properly distributed and used. Uh, physical assets will not get the returns that they deserve. And human assets, as in our skills and ability, will not get the returns that we deserve because our employers may not pay us because they don't have social capital. So this is the situation where we have four capitals and the, th the fourth one, social capital, does not have an independent income generating function, but in its absence, the ability of the other three to generate income is significantly uh, disabled, and that disimpairment can actually be measured and valued. And that's the way to value social capital, and that's how we do it as well. Uh, the Inclusive Wealth Report is, in my opinion, a true balance sheet of nations, and this uh, diagram comes from the latest version, that is the 2018 Inclusive Wealth Report. And in this, they, they show uh, a bit of uh, a, a challenging story, which is that there has been, no doubt, an increase between 1990 and 2015, sorry, 2014, of manufactured, as in physical capital and human capital, but there has simultaneously been a very serious decline in natural capital. And please note, these are per capita numbers. This is human, social, human natural, and physical capital per capita. No doubt this is the reason why President Putin thinks climate change is a good idea, because there seems to be robust growth of natural capital based on the statistics in Russia. Um, but that is not the case generally in most other countries, as you can see. And if we look at the year-on-year -year changes, um, again, the story becomes obvious that there has been a gradual increase in physical capital per capita and a gradual increase in human capital and the blue dots, a gradual simultaneous decrease in natural capital per capita. And that is the challenge because that lack of natural capital is putting everything at risk. Another interesting uh, conclusion from the Inclusive Wealth Reports, and this one is from the 2014, is this diagram which shows the distribution as a fraction, as a percentage of natural capital out of total capital per capita versus that's on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, human capital. And what this shows you is the dark dots, the black dots. No surprises, these are the developed world. And it shows you also the low-income companies which are in the high natural capital per capita in the bottom right-hand corner, but also very low income. <coughs> to me, the challenge of development planners and development economists is how do you build natural capital to a point where the look and feel of the developing country is more and more like that of the developed country, which means not to deplete natural capital, which is the GDP of the poor, or is a large part of the GDP of the poor, but rather to build human capital, which means maybe counterintuitively focusing on not just the overall area of the country, but focusing on cities as the engines of human productivity, on focusing on not just the hardware of cities, not the buildings and the infrastructure, but actually the software of cities. How do we create creativity? How do we create lifestyle? 
How do we make cities interesting places for smart young people to live and grow and develop? How do we actually aggregate these people into larger and larger pools of talent so that those pools gather critical mass so that they actually become globally competitive so that the city economy can thrive and compete and be successful? To me, that is the key challenge of development economists today. And those who keep arguing still, despite this common sense and despite the evidence that we present here, that, oh, no, there's a trade-off between environment and development, I think they've got it completely wrong. I think they fail to understand two important equations. One is that if you look at, let us say, Brazil, Indonesia, and India, and we have indeed we have done these studies, if we look at ecosystem services as a fraction of the household incomes of poor communities, then we will find they are a very large fraction, between 45 and 90 percent in some cases. In Indonesia, we've actually tested this right down to the province level as well. Um, so that's one thing they miss. And the other thing they miss is the importance of developing human capital and using that as the driver of, inno of innovation and using that innovation uh, as a driver of economic success. So I think uh, this, this report is important for all kinds of reasons, not just, of course, the fact that it gets the capital's lexicon right. Now, having said that, uh, given that the UN has adopted a capital's lexicon, which is four capitals, how much sense does it make for us, all of us, now focusing on the corporate space, to develop a lexicon at the micro level which has not the same four capitals? And in my opinion, very little sense. And I've tried to adapt that four capitals lexicon to our space in the following way. Recognizing that the three uh, types of capital are physical, human, and natural, and that these are the ones that earn income, here's a diagram which illustrates by example the various objects, if you like, the various assets which fall into these various categories. The physical capital on the top left-hand box are basically privately owned physical capital items. Human capital privately owned is by the individual, but there can be human capital as in traditional community knowledge that's owned by the community and to which, for which it deserves compensation if it's taken. And please note that social capital is a binding force. It's not a separate column, but it's rather a horizontal cross-cutting row. That social capital exists not just in private ownership, but in community ownership and in public ownership. And perhaps the surprising one is that it exists even in private ownership because markets are generally trading private goods and services, in fact, only trading private goods and services. And if you did not have social capital in markets, in other words, if you didn't have properly designed market rules and regulations, if you didn't have uh, the law of contract, if you didn't have uh, etiquette, indeed, amongst the market makers to provide prices where, which the market therefore gets, from which the market gets depth and liquidity. Liquidity as in the ability to transact a large amount without changing the price, depth as in many people able to give you a price. If you didn't have all that, that social capital, then what kind of market would you be left with? So actually even the private side of this picture of capitals does require social capital. And of course the community is all about social capital and of course there is a huge range of social capital that is necessary when it comes to managing public goods, whether they are physical public goods like roads and bridges and, and toll gates and, and hospitals and so on, or whether it's natural public goods like the high seas, national parks, and so on. So these are examples where, now, the point I will make here, which is very simple, which is that if you have a large multinational corporation, what we are asking it to report is basically whatever is in the top left-hand box. In other words, the physical capital owned by shareholder, its balance sheet of last year versus its balance sheet of this year is basically the top left-hand box. And yet, tell me the large multinational corporation which doesn't provide health insurance services for its employees, which doesn't train them and doesn't provide job skills, which, tell me which uh, uh, pharmaceutical company does not use traditional community no knowledge, tell me which company does not either use or pl put into public knowledge Wikipedia type of data, Tell me which company in transportation does not use roads and bridges. <laughs> Tell me which company which is in fisheries does not use the high seas or, or does not, if it's in logging, not use uh, publicly owned parks and, and so on. So I think the, this entire space of capitals, be it privately owned, community owned, or publicly owned, actually is the space in which companies operate. They have impacts on all of these. And unfortunately, they are not being asked to report anything other than the top left-hand box. And that is the challenge. And how do we get them 
moving out from there. And this is why when we talk about integrated reporting, we need to look at reporting the externalities in each of these boxes. And these are just uh, terms that we use. F, you know, HCX is human capital externalities, NCX is natural capital externalities. The reason it says trademarks is that I, I didn't want them to be misused. But getting the ability to use for anybody in this audience is just one email away. Just write us an email and we'll reply saying, here's the definitions, please use only these definitions, confirm. You will write a second email confirming it and that's it. The trademark is yours, that's all it needs. But we don't want these terms misused, that's the reason why it's trademarked. Uh, the questions that I want to uh, answer, which must be in the, in the minds of some of you is, but what about intellectual capital, IIRC? the International Integrated Reporting Council has intellectual capital. Well, the fact is that intellectual capital in this day and age is embedded in all, almost every other kind of capital. I mean, this box of tissues out here, very thoughtfully placed, has intellectual capital. There's technology in making this box. There's huge technology in making this tissue. Um, there's massive technology in this, of course. These are all intellectual capitals, but they're embedded in a physical capital, privately owned. I can buy this, I can sell that. In the same way, education and skills are human capital, which is intellectual in nature. I have some of those, you have some of those. We are, may belong to a traditional community or we may belong to other communities which we have community or shared knowledge, so that would be human capital in, in, in uh, the community space. And of course, even in natural capital, there is potential for biomimicry, which I would say is natural capital in public ownership. So potential intellectual capital from nature which is in public ownership waiting for us to discover it and make use of it. So there is intellectual capital everywhere in, in all of these boxes. Therefore, there is intellectual capital. We don't need to create a new category for that. That's the point I'm making here. And in essence, uh, the question generally that's often asked is, but what about the six capitals approach? How does this, these four capitals of the United Nations uh, report inclusive wealth per square with that? Well, they do. Because as we open out the four cap categories, we find that many are similar. Physical capital is basically financial plus manufactured. That's the IRC. Human capital is human. Social is social. And natural is natural. And the intellectual capital I've just explained. It lies in one of different boxes, one of these five different boxes of intellectual capital, be it human, physical, or natural. So I think there is every reason to be optimistic. These are complex problems. I don't wish to belittle them, but they can be solved and uh, over to all of you to help us solve them. Thank you. I'm going to try to articulate this vague question, but you had different books for policy and you spent uh, this discussion talking about the private sector, but I'm wondering if the public sector regulatory system policy environment is going to be there to mitigate risks that investors would see and many of the countries we work in, the investors aren't going into. <clears throat> How did the policy community react to what you put out there a few years ago in those tomes? And how are you adjusting the way you're now engaging policymakers yeah. to yeah. encourage them to use this? Because once they do, yeah. in principle, the investors will flock in to a de-risked environment. Yes, no, you're quite right about that. So my own view on how to engage policymakers is has changed over the last 10 years. If you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have said, present them the analysis and hound them until they agree with you and then make changes. I, I don't do that anymore because it doesn't work. So my, my new theory of change, not new, because it's there in Corporation 2020 since 2012, is that we need to work with the private sector to impress upon the public sector because there is so much of policy capture that is prevalent in every nation, be it developed nations or developing nations, there is so much policy capture by the private sector that you really can't get policy to change without leveraging the, the inroads of the private sector into the policy space. 
And the reasons are not difficult to see, because if you look at the report card of any politician today, it's about GDP growth. Well, two-thirds of that comes from the private sector. It's about jobs. Again, two-thirds on average, and in the US, 74% come from the private sector. If you, if you look at the third point in the report card of the politician is these days fiscal gap management. So after income tax, normally corporation tax is the second most important source of revenue. So again, corporation. And fourthly, of course, campaign funding, where maybe some would argue more than 100% comes from the private sector. <laughs> so, so if you look at the four things that make the report card of a politician as to why he should be or she should be elected next year, all four boxes are ticked by the corporation. So why would a politician not listen to the corporation? And that's been my refrain uh, for some time now, and hence the need to work with the private sector. But to get to the private sector, to make them make the changes, uh, I think you need uh, a, a groundswell of public opinion. Uh, coming through citizens, uh, and I don't want to belittle this, because they, it's not just about the consumer voting with her pocket, which is the sentence that you will hear very often, but it's also the citizen voting with her voice and making it plain that certain things are or are not acceptable, drawing the ethical line between what is acceptable and not. And I think that does make a difference to the responsible CEO. And I think all of us can see that the, the sort of results that we saw at, um, at the Paris COP um, in, in 2015 could not have been possible had not the private sector spoken with one voice saying that, look, this is not an acceptable state of affairs. We support the idea of an agreement had that groundswell of people, uh, pressure, and, and uh, corporate leadership not been unanimous in their, in their or near unanimous, I'm not including the Koch brothers and so on, but near unanimous in their, in their communication to the, to the policy space, that may not have happened. So I would say you, you're, you're dead right, that without the policymaker, without the rules and regulations being appropriately managed, without the, the social capital, the structures that create social capital being, being put in place, there's very little hope for uh, a sensible investor interest in any, in any nation or any jurisdiction. But how to get there, I think that's what I'm saying, is, is probably needs to be more nuanced and more, more complex, recognizing the, the theory of change from people to corporations and then from there to the policymakers. Thank you very much for that enlightening talk. Uh, I, uh, I really liked that uh, graph that you saw, uh, which emphasized on the, um, we don't have to always look at uh, trade-offs between yeah. certain capitals, yes. but there, is way, there are ways to um, you know, increase both of them. So um, both are like more capitals at the same time. Yes. yes. Um, along that line, do you have some suggestions or some thoughts towards um, uh, some specific things that we could do uh, or some uh, sectors, some um, innovations that we should focus on uh, so that we can shift that uh, production possibility frontier forward and increase the production of natural capital yeah. as well as other capitals. Well, I, I think the point that you make generally is correct, but I think the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So it, it does become very challenging to, to be able to move the needle of production of natural goods and services simply because they are in the public space. Uh, you can, uh, well, it should be, uh, ethically, it should be the role of governments to invest in public capital. At the end of the day, if, if public equity is not invested in public capital, then what will be? But at the same time, there is a lot of private interest, philanthropic interest, and NGO interest. And unfortunately, it's difficult to uh, go much beyond that because the reality is that private capital chases private returns. And even when private capital is philanthropic, uh, for the sake of argument, plants a forest and there is evapotranspiration, and yes, there will be clouds, and yes, there will be rainfall, but you cannot tell the clouds where to rain. So the nature of the public good is such that it defies market logic. And therefore, there's only a limited amount of market logic that can be used to actually achieve the results that you seek, which is an increase in the production frontier of natural goods and services, of, of ecosystem services, or nature's contribution to people. So we need to involve the policy space. But of course, as the lady here mentioned, the, the nature of the engagement and the nature of the involvement of, pol of policy space is unfortunately more complicated, perhaps, than just producing good research and giving it to the policymaker. 
Um, in, in regards to the, um, the truly heartfelt and thoughtful distinction that is made in TEAB and in this community between value and price, it seems inevitable that as um, private investments and, um, and financiers um, see the, the potential value of natural capital as an asset class, that there will be countries in the lower right corner yes. of that, of that um, the the wonderfully pleasure. linear yeah. line that's, that's so peculiar yeah. to see something like that, <laughs> that in, in right. global economics. Yeah. But um, it seems almost inevitable that there's going to be cases where countries in that region, in that quadrant, um, mm -hmm. will be tempted to engage in securitization of natural capital assets and ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. What sorts of mechanisms, institutions, oversight, mm -hmm. cautionary tales can be deployed to prevent that? Mm. No, but, yeah, that's a great question, and thank you. There, there, there are actually quite a few uh, success stories, as well as, I would say, failure stories, which, which are there in, in the various TEAB reports, as what, what did and did not work. Um, I think the, the important thing is to look at, um, look at it from the point of view of uh, the jurisdiction that enable, the enabling jurisdiction. So it could be a province, it could be a country, it could be even deeper, down, right down to a small district, and to see what happens. So I think understanding things that work or don't work from a community perspective, a district perspective, or a province or state perspective becomes really important. Um, but even at those levels, what we will find is that the private sector plays a role, could be disruptive, could be constructive, as the case may be. And very often, the choice between or the, or the, whether it is constructive or, or destructive depends on numerous factors, which are social, which are whether they are a local company or a multinational, whether they are accountable and members of the local community or not members of the local community. Uh, because at the end of the day, they are, the, they are the, the pools of capital that are needed for any change whether it's paying for ecosystem services or whether it's planting a forest or whatever it is that we are trying to, to achieve on the ground. The largest pool is private capital. And the question is how to leverage, how to uh, bring it, bring that private capital into public service. Because it will not automatically do that. That is the challenge. There will have to be incentives and disincentives. By, by its definition and its nature, private capital will chase private returns. Uh, and then we have to figure out ways how do we make the exception work. So in that sense, we are always struggling against uh, this fundamental law of human nature, if I may say so. Um, and I think there are many lessons to be learned there. So there, there are numerous, numerous uh, uh, positive stories as well, where incentives have been carefully designed to enable um, um, communities to work with corporations in the better maintenance of tracts of land, the better management of tracts of land, or, or of forests, or of wetlands, and so on. So I think there's, uh, it's, it's a space worth considering. So it, it, is, um, it is the case that as we begin to start using economic logic and valuations to go back to your, your starting point, as we start using the logic of economics to try and say this is an appropriate reward or this is an appropriate compensation, there will be some degree of, of uh, monetization. There will be some degree of, if you like, the entering of the private interest. But the whole challenge lies in how do you make that private interest work in the public good. And that's never a straightforward. It's not just about opening up the market. That doesn't work. Yeah. All right. Join me in thanking Pavan for that, uh, that really wonderful talk. And